Chapter One of The Secret of Lonesome Cove by Samuel Hopkins Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter One The Body on the Beach. Lonesome Cove is one of the least frequented stretches on the New England seaboard. From the land side, the sheer hundred-foot drop of Hawk Hill Cliffs shuts it off. Access by water is denied, denied with a show of menacing teeth when the sea curls its lips back amid a swirl of angry currents from its rocks and reefs warning boats away. There is no settlement near the cove. The somber repute suggested by its name has served to keep cottagers from building on the wildly beautiful uplands that overbrood the beach. Sheep browse through the thickets of ash and wild cherry extending almost to the brink of the height, and the straggling pathways along the edge, worn by the feet of their herders, afford the only suggestion of human traffic within half a mile of the spot. A sharp-cut ravine leads down to the sea by a rather treacherous descent. Near the mouth of this opening, a considerable gathering of folk speckled the usually deserted beach at noon of July 6th. They centered on a dark object a few yards within the flood-tide limit. Some scouted about, peering at the sand. Others pointed first to the sea then to the cliffs with the open gestures of those who argue vehemently, but always their eyes returned, drawn back by an unfailing magnetism, to the central object. From some distance away a lone man of a markedly different type from the others observed them with an expression of displeasure. He had reached the cove by an arduous scramble, possibly only to a good climber, around the jutting elbow of the cliff to the northward. It was easily to be read in his face that he was both surprised and annoyed to find people there before him. One of the group presently detached himself and ambled over to the newcomer, with an accelerated speed as he drew nearer. "'Swanee!' he ejaculated. "'If it ain't Professor Kent! Didn't know you at first under them whiskers!' You remember me, don't you? I used to drive you around when you was here before. How are you, Jarvis? returned the other. Still in the livery business, I suppose? Yes. What brings you here, Professor? Holidays. I've just come out of the woods. And as you have some very interesting sea currents just here, I thought I'd have a look at them. Nobody really knows anything about coast currents, you know. Now my opportunity is spoiled. He indicated the crowd by a movement of his head. Spoiled? I guess not. You couldn't have come at a better time, said the local man eagerly. Ah, but you see, I had planned to swim out to the eddy and make some personal observations. You was going to swim into dead man's eddy? asked the other, aghast. "'Why, Professor, you must have turned foolish. They ain't a man on this coast would take a chance like that.' "'Superstition,' retorted the other, curtly. "'On a still day such as this, there would be no danger to an experienced swimmer. The conditions are ideal, except for this crowd. What is it? Has the village gone picnicking?' "'Not scarcely. Ain't you heard? Another one's come in through the eddy. Lies over yonder.' Professor Kent's eyebrows went up as he glanced toward the indicated spot, then gathered in a frown. "'Not washed up there, surely,' he said. "'That's what,' answered Jarvis. "'When?' "'Sometime early this morning.' Pshaw, said the other, turning to look at the curving bulwark of rocks over which the soft slow swell was barely breaking. If it were the other end of the cove now, I could understand it. Yes, agreed Jarvis, 
They mostly come in at the other end, on this tide. Mostly? Always. The professor's tone was positive. Unless my charts are wrong. But this, well, it spoils at least one phase of my theory. Theory? exclaimed the livery man, his pale eyes alight. You got a theory? But I thought you didn't know anything about the body till I told you just now. Oh, my ruined theory has reference to the currents, sighed the other. It has nothing to do with the dead men as such. Neither has this, was the prompt response, delivered with a jerk of the thumb toward the dark object. No? What is it, then, if not a dead man? A dead woman. Oh, all the same, it shouldn't have come in on this section of the beach at all. That ain't half the strangeness of it, the way it washed in. Lonesome Cove has had some queer folks drift home to it, but nothing as queer as this. Come and see for yourself. Still frowning, Professor Kent suffered himself to be led to the spot. Two or three of the group, as it parted before him, greeted him. He found himself looking down on a corpse clad in a dark silk dress and stretched on a wooden grating to which it was lashed with a small rope. Everything about the body indicated wealth. The dress was expensively made. The shoes were of the best type, and the stockings were silk. The head was marred by a frightful bruise, which had crushed in the right side and extended around behind the ear. Blood had clotted thickly in the short, close-curled hair. The left side was unmarked. The eyes were closed, and the mouth was slightly open, showing a glint of gold amid very white and regular teeth. An expression of deadly terror distorted the face. Professor Kent bent closely over it. "'That's strange, very strange,' he murmured. "'It should be peaceful.' "'But look at the hand!' cried Jarvis. Here, indeed, was the astounding feature of the tragedy, the aspect that brought Kent to his knees the more closely to observe. The body lay twisted slightly to the right, with the left arm extended. The left wrist was enclosed in a light rusted handcuff, to which a chain was fastened. At the end of the chain was the companion cuff, shattered, evidently by a powerful blow, and half buried in the sand. As Kent leaned over the corpse, a fat, powerful, grizzled man with a metal badge on his shirt front pushed forward. "'Them's cast-iron cuffs,' he announced. "'That kind ain't been used these forty years.' "'What kind of a ship would be carrying them nowadays?' asked someone in the crowd. "'And what kind of a seaman would be putting of them on a lady's wrists?' growled a formidable voice which Kent, looking up, perceived to have come from a mid of growth of heavy white whiskers, sprouting from a weather-furrowed face. "'Seafaring man, aren't you?' inquired Kent. "'No more. Fifty year of it, man and boy, has put me in harbor.' "'That's Sailor Smith,' explained Jarvis, who had assumed the duties of a self-appointed Cicerone. Not much about the sea and its ways, good or bad, that he don't know. True for you, confirmed several voices. Then, Mr. Smith, will you take a look at those lashings and tell me whether, in your opinion, they are the work of a sailor? asked Kent. The old hands fumbled expertly. The old face puckered. Judgment came forth presently. The knots is well enough. The lashin's a passable job. What gets me is the rope. Well, what's wrong with the rope? Nothing in particular. Only I don't know what just that style of rope would be doin' on shipboard, unless it was to hang the old man's wash on. Suppose we lift this grating, Kent suggested. At this, the man with the badge interposed. "'Say, who's running this thing, anyhow?' 
I'm sheriff here, and this body ain't to be moved till a doctor has viewed it. Of course, said Kent mildly, but I thought you might be interested to see, Mr. Sheriff, whether a ship's name was stamped somewhere on this grating. Well, I don't want any amateur learning me my business, declared the official importantly. Nevertheless, he heaved the woodwork up on edge and held it so, while eager eyes scanned the underpart. Murmurs of disappointment followed. In these, Kent did not join. He had inserted a finger in a crevice of the splintered wood and had extracted some small object which he held in the palm of his hand, examining it thoughtfully. "'What you got there?' demanded the sheriff. Professor Kent stretched out his hand, disclosing a small grayish object. "'I should take it to be the cocoon of Ephestia Cuchniella,' he announced. "'And what does he do for a living?' inquired the official, waxing humorous. "'Destroys crops. It's a species of grain moth.' "'Oh,' grunted Schlager. "'You're a bug collector, huh?' "'Exactly,' answered the other, transferring his trove to his pocket. Thereafter he seemed to lose interest in the center of mystery. Withdrawing to some distance, he paced up and down the shore, whistling lively tunes, not always in perfect accord, from which a deductive mind might have inferred that his soul was not in the music. Nearer and nearer to high-water mark his pacing took him. Presently, though all the time continuing his whistling, he was scanning the tangled debris that the highest tide of the year had heaped up, almost against the cliff's foot. His whistling became slow, lugubrious, minor. It sagged. It died away. When it rose again, it was in March time, whereto the virtuoso stepped briskly toward the crowd. By this time the group had received several additions, but had suffered the loss of one of its component parts, the sheriff. Conjecture was buzzing from mouth to mouth as to the official's sudden defection. "'Whatever it was he got from the pocket,' Kent heard one of the men say, "'it started him quick.' "'Looked to me like an envelope,' hazarded someone. "'No,' contradicted Sailor Smith. Paper would have been all pulped up by the water. Marked handkerchief, maybe? suggested another. Like as not, said Jarvis. You bet that Len Schlager figured it out there was something in it for him, anyways. I could see the money gleam in his eye. That's right, too, confirmed the old sailor. He looked just like that when he brought in that half-wit peddler thinking he was the thousand-dollar reward thief last year. Trust Len Schlager to look out for number one first and be sheriff afterward, observed someone else. Amidst this interchange of opinion, none of which was lost upon him, Professor Kent advanced and bent over the manacled corpse. "'Have to ask you to stand back, Professor,' said Jarvis. Len's appointed me special deputy till he comes back, and he says nobody is to lay finger on hide nor hair of the corpse, not even the dock if he comes. Quite right, assented the other. Sheriff Schlager exhibits commendable zeal and discretion. Wonder if he knowed the corpse, suggested somebody in the crowd. Tell you who did if he didn't, said another man. Who, then? Elder Iry Dennett. Didn't none of you hear about his meeting up with a strange woman yesterday evening? Shocks! This couldn't be that woman, said Jarvis. How'd she come to be washed ashore from a wreck between last night and this morning? How'd she come to be washed ashore from a wreck anyway? countered Sailor Smith. They ain't been no storm for a week. And this body ain't been dead twenty-four hour. It plumb beats me, admitted Jarvis. Who is this Dennett? 
asked Professor Kent. Irie? He's the town gab of Martindale Center. Does a little plumbin' and tinkerin' on the side. Just now he's up to Katie's town. Took the ten o'clock train last night. Then it was early when he met this woman? Little after sundown. He was risin' the hill beyond the nook, that Sedgwick's place, the painter feller. When she comes out of the shrubbery, pop. He quizzed her. Trust the elder for that. But he didn't get much out of her until he mentioned the nook. Then she allowed she'd guessed she'd go there. And he watched her go. You say a man named Sedgwick lives at the nook. Is that Francis Sedgwick, the artist? asked Kent. That's him, said Sailor Smith. Paints right pretty pictures. Lives there all alone with a Chinese cook. Well, the lady went down the hill, continued Jarvis, just as Sedgwick came out to smoke a pipe on his stone wall. Irie thought he seemed surprised when she bespoke him. They passed a few remarks, and then they had some words, and the lady laughed loud and kind of scornful. He seemed to be pointing at a necklace of queer, fiery pink stones that she wore, and trying to get something out of her. She turned away, and he started to follow, when all of a sudden she grabbed up a rock and let him have it, blip, keeled him clean over. Then she ran away up the road toward Hawk Hill Cliffs. That's the way Irie Dennett tells it. But I ain't never heard of a story losin' anything in the tellin' when it comes through Irie's lips. Well, this corpse ain't got no pink necklace, suggested somebody. Bodies sometimes gets robbed, said Sailor Smith. Chester Kent stooped over the writhen face, again peering close. Then he straightened up and began pulling thoughtfully at the lobe of his ear. He pulled and pulled until, as if by that process, he had turned his face toward the cliff. His lips pursed. He began whistling softly and tunelessly. His gaze was abstracted. "'Ain't seen nothing to make you feel bad, have you, Professor?' inquired temporary Deputy Sheriff Jarvis with some acerbity. "'Eh, what?' said Kent absently. "'Seen anything? Nothing but what's there for anyone to see.' Following his fixed gaze, the others studied the face of the cliff, all but Sailor Smith. He blinked nearsightedly at the corpse. "'Say,' said he presently, "'what's them queer little marks on the neck, under the ear?' Back came Kent's eyes. "'Those?' he said, smiling. Why, those are, one might suppose, such indentations as would be made in flesh by forcing a jewel setting violently against it by a blow or strong impact. Then you think it was the wom— began the old seaman when several voices broke in. There goes Len now! The sheriff's heavy figure appeared on the brow of the cliff, moving toward the village. "'Who is it with him?' inquired Kent. "'Gansett Jim,' answered Jarvis. "'An Indian?' "'Gosh, you got good eyes,' said Jarvis. "'He's more Indian than anything else. Comes from down Amagansett way, and gets his name from it.' "'Huh. When did he arrive?' "'While you was traipsing around up yonder.' "'Did he see the body?' Yep. Just after the sheriff got whatever it was from the pocket, Gansett Jim hove in sight. Len went over to him quick and said something to him. He come and give a look at the body, but he didn't say nothing, only grunted. Never does say nothing, only grunt, put in Sailor Smith. That's right, agreed Jarvis. Well, the sheriff tells me to watch the body. Then he says, and I'll need somebody to help me. I'll take you, Jim. So he and the Indian goes away together. 
Professor Kent nodded. He looked seaward where the reefs were now bearing their teeth more plainly through the racing currents, and he sighed. That sigh meant, in effect, I want to play with my tides and eddies, and here is work thrown at my very feet. Then he bade the group farewell and set off up the beach. "'Seems kind of interested, don't he?' remarked one of the natives. "'Who is he, anyway?' inquired another. "'Oh, he's a sort of a harmless scientific crank,' explained Jarvis, with patronizing kindliness. "'Comes from Washington. Something to do with the government work.' "'Kind of loony, I think.' conjectured a little thin piping man. Musses and moves around like it. "'Is that so?' said Sailor Smith, who still had his eyes fixed on the scarified neck. "'Well, I ain't any too dumb sure that he's as big a fool as some folks I know that thinks likelier of theirselves.' Others, however, supported the little man's diagnosis and there was some feeling against Sailor Smith who refused to make the vote unanimous. "'No, sir,' he persisted sturdily. "'That dude way of talking of his has got something back of it, I'll bet. He seen there was something queer about that rope, and he asked me about the knots right off. He knows enough not to spit to windward, and don't you forget it. Wouldn't surprise me none if he was pointing pretty nigh as close up into the wind as Len Schlager. Possibly the one supporter of the absent would have wavered in his loyalty had he seen the trove that Professor Chester Kent had carried unostentatiously from the beach in his pocket after picking it from the grating. It was the fuzzy cocoon of a small and quite unimportant insect. Perhaps the admiring Mr. Smith might even have come around to the majority opinion regarding Professor Kent's intellectual futility, could he have observed the absorbed interest with which the Washington scientist, seated on a boulder, opened up the cocoon, pricked it until the impotent inmate wriggled in protest, and then, casting it aside to perish, threw himself on his back and whistled the whole of Chopin's funeral march mostly off the key end of chapter 1 recording by roger moline